in America is it's, it's virtually all genetically modified. So when they genetically modify it, they've, they've changed the way that the grain grows. And they basically, corn is the same way, unfortunately. They, they've trained it to grow pesticides into the, to the wheat germ so that it preserves it. Well, not preserves it, but protects it from bugs. Corn, when we were kids, uh, when we ate corn, there was usually worms. When you peel corn, I don't know if you remember as a kid peeling corn and there'd be a worm in there. That's not there anymore because they've grown pesticides into the kernels and it's literally all that way uh, in America. And so, was there a question? So, um, so that's part of why it's a problem. And then they deaminate it, which means they, they restructure the protein so it has a better shelf life. And so the human digestive system doesn't recognize that anymore. You can go to Eastern Bloc countries um, and eat the wheat and not have nearly the side effects and the, the symptoms that you would when you when you eat it in, in America. And my last uh, office manager is an O blood type. O blood types are the most grain sensitive. Uh, she had all kinds of gallbladder issues. She'd have you know abdominal cramping and and bloating and and female symptoms uh, from from grains. Uh, she went to uh, Europe to visit her husband at the time. Sorry to say, <laughs> visit her husband. And uh, she could eat the bread there. Literally, the first snack she had on the plane on her way back to America, she had her gallbladder spasms again and was back out, you know, feeling lousy. Uh, it's unfortunate that's what we're dealing with right now. Uh, so there are some options. Go ahead. What about foods that are uh, labeled organic, like organic pork? Still bad? Yeah, I'm, I'm better. So organic's not going to have the pesticides and sh technically should not be GM genetically modified. So that is a step up. That's good. Um, better alternatives from a bread perspective is Ezekiel bread because that is a live sprouted grain bread. So when it's sprouted and alive like that, it still has the enzymes in there so we can digest it and metabolize it. Uh, spelt is another option that at this point is still relatively neutral and it's one of the lowest gluten containing grains. Spelt, S-P-E-L-T. I think I have that in the slide or two to go. Um, so spelt is another alternative. And the spelt bread's usually pretty good. It's one of Laura and Josie's favorites as well because it's, it's almost a white bread type of a flavor and texture um, and it look and so the kids will enjoy it typically. So I know there's a big push for whole wheat recently <clears throat> Now, what's the difference between a whole wheat versus whole grain? So whole grain is multiples of whole wheat, is whole wheat and some of the other grains with it. Typically, there's nine grain or some things like that where they blend other grains in there. So it's all just a bunch of BS? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so truly. We were told, you know, we all right. grew up on Wonder Bread. Right. And then now this day and age, there's this big push for, you know, got to have wheat bread. Right. Now you're saying wheat bread's no good. Right. And, and I, was, I did the whole wheat bread for 20 years. I mean, 79, I started modifying my diet as a, as a youngin. Um, I realized how lousy I felt eating sugar and stuff. I, I quit eating it uh, at about her age. And I haven't eaten it since. So at that point, I said, Mom, white bread's junk. Like you're talking about, you know, whole wheat. Got to have whole wheat. Uh, but then I was, uh, I was diagnosed allergic and uh, had an allergy to wheat, but I kept eating it. Um, one of the things with wheat is, is major brain fade. Basically, it, it starves the brain of glucose. And so that's the kind of the ADD, the kid that we just showed. Um, that's, that's this kid. Uh, wheat could just as well have been what he ate for breakfast because um, it starves no, the brain. No. White bread is made with wheat, obviously, it's been bleached. Right. So, but that says whole wheat. Right. What's so, the difference between white bread and Yeah, great question. It, the, the, and I almost cringe saying it, but reality is, when we're talking brain chemistry like this, whole, whole wheat is almost worse than, than <laughs> white bread. <laughs> and I, I cringe to say it because, I mean, <laughs> the, the, I cringe to say it because uh, white bread is basically going to be like sugar. I mean, so that, that's, you might as well, you know, feed them the Halloween candy before they go to school. Um, but whole wheat, because of the way it starves the brain for, for glucose and for energy, is going to be a little bit more detrimental and it actually shrinks the brain a little bit more. Unfortunately, yes. What about sourdough? Because my my family loves it. Uh huh. We get this those two the simple sourdough with like limited ingredients. Right. And I've heard that um, it metabolizes differently because it's fermented and it's cultured. Right. So uh, uh, that's kind of the step. Um, uh, so let's say whole wheat's worse, white flour's you know second worst. Uh, sourdough is going to be close because it's still a, a processed f grain, but it is cultured, so it's, it's got some of the yeast type stuff, some of the predigested enzyme type things in there. 
but really um, spelt is going to have, have that sort of almost that flavor and it's going to work a lot better for you. Yeah, we eat Ezekiel. Yeah, so Ezekiel is even better typically. Um, so those are good options and realistically, I mean, the grain's so adulterated, I'm eating less and less bread all the time. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I just, I don't feel good on it. I mean, I, I stole a couple pieces of uh, my youngest kid's French toast the other day before a bike, uh, the night before a bike ride, and I could feel it, the way I was pedaling and, you know, I was complaining to my buddy as I was riding up the hill, ah, French toast. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'm a performance junkie, I, 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 that's where I learn a lot of this, is because I'm looking to see how I feel. Uh, this is a lab before you. <laughs> um, so again, white flour sh really sh literally sh shrink. Excuse me, whole wheat literally shrinks the brain. I spent hours and hours and hours on. I've seen slides of brains on wheat and gluten and gluten intolerance. So all of you hear about gluten intolerance and that sort of stuff, celiac sprue and that sort of thing. That's when it affects the gut. The gut and the brain are very closely related in the way that they function. Same neurochemistry and that same brain chemicals and that sort of stuff. Um, but the, brain, the effects in the brain are actually more profound than they are in the gut and a lot more rampant. And so there's a lot of MRIs, or I've seen these MRIs of brains shrink, literally shrinking uh, consume, by consuming whole wheat. And they've got white placking, like, like um, almost lipoma nodule looking things in placking in the brain uh, and then they cut the gluten out and the brain kind of goes back to normal after three to six months. So the good news is it's somewhat reversible. Uh, the bad news is it's very detrimental to the brain. Uh, I spent hours and hours trying to find those slides on Medline and all that sort of stuff um, and unsuccessfully but I've seen great slides on really demonstrating the negative impact of, of grains on the brain. And there's a, a Per Lemutter or something right, wrote a book called Grain Brain. Uh, he's got a lot of good uh, information on the internet and stuff as well on that. Do they know that that's, that that's all it was or was it usually in conjunction with other things to people that eat whole wheat? I mean, right, so that's a great question. You're perfectly healthy and your only bad thing is you eat whole wheat? Is right. Is that bad for you or is it usually in conjunction with other stuff? Right, so this is peer reviewed. Uh, journals that are doing this and so that was the only variable they had uh, to make it a, a legit study and there's there's many studies along this line that, that do that have demonstrated that effect so for those re reports those uh, papers yes it was the pretty much the only change that was done so I mean it's pretty profound so yeah good question and because that's how I read literature too I mean uh, somebody's telling me dealing with a, a neighbor that has breast cancer she came across this oh you know this dental correlation with it and stuff too it's like yeah, the person's going to have lousy teeth if they're unhealthy, <laughs> you know. So was it because they were, had lousy health, they had breast cancer, or was it the teeth that caused the breast cancer? You know, you got to look, at, look between the lines like you're doing. Good question. So foods that block learning, just to, to reiterate, we got the sugar, we got white flour is, is close to white to sugar. Uh, but then we'll talk a little bit about aspartame, uh, which is the artificial sweeteners, and we talked about the whole wheat. Uh, so I'll talk about aspartame next. Uh, as the adult, a lot of this is some I see a lot as a cyclist, uh, the knee pain, the anterior knee pain. Speaking of, how many of you are um, on Facebook? I post uh, kind of health pearls on Facebook pretty, tip, pretty much every day or five days a week, four to five days a week. Um, some kind of jewel, hopefully, that, that will help people. You know, if I have right tonight or yesterday, I posted about pain on the inside of the knee and how that affects, that is typically caused by stress manifestations. What I'm talking about right now is anterior knee pain or what I talked about uh, Thursday, Friday, last week, the, the muscles, the quad muscles will turn off, especially if it's almost guaranteed, if both knees are hurting on the, the kneecap area, that's almost guaranteed an artificial sweetener manifestation because of the way that affects the small intestine and absorption. If that's going on, you're also killing brain cells, unfortunately, with the aspartame or the artificial sweeteners. So um, artificial sweeteners, again, will cause a weakening of the quads, um, but they'll also, they're called excitotoxins um, because they, we've talked about white flour enough, uh, it's basically glue, oh, just a quick sidebar, um, oh, some of you, about half of you don't have this in your notes, the nursing home, if you're interested in finding like gluten-free meal plans and recipes and that sort of stuff, Kelly Smith, friend of mine from church, um, does this uh, blog and she's just finished a uh, uh, cookbook and stuff with a bunch of gluten-free desserts and recipes and things like that. The nursing home, so check your what, page 16, see if you have, some of you didn't get this, sorry. I put it in after I made about the first half of the notes, <laughs> first half of the copies. Anyway, the nurse, Kelly Smith, does a lot of gluten-free. She had a lot of gluten issues as a uh, 
early adulthood, uh, and she has eradicated it, and she's a big blogger on it now. Um, Okay, I'll talk about spark, uh, artificial sweeteners in a minute. We got uh, one more on the um, gluten-associated uh, cross-reactive foods. So this is a whole other uh, subject. As we're talking about the gluten, though, we need to understand that there are foods that can cross-react as if, you know, we were talking about the white flour and that sort of stuff. You know, and I mentioned spelt. Most of the time, 90% of the time, spelt is a far better option. But there is that segment of the population that spelt is actually going to cause that gluten type of a reaction. So this is a, a Cyrex Labs has just come out in about the last three years. Um, I, I'm a, I do applied kinesiology where I muscle test and stuff. I've basically taken what they do with this lab and we can muscle test and figure out if buckwheat is one that I've seen a lot. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the, um, where'd it go, sesame. Um, any of these foods can cross-react as if it was gluten. And so the good news is when, when you identify this, the specific grain, then, then it's, it's almost free reign for the others. So the, really the trick as the, the parent or the adult, especially if you're dealing with some of these issues with yourself or your child, is identify the main trigger. Uh, it could be oats. It could be coffee, uh, whey, dairy is one I saw the other day. I'll tell, show you a good study on that next. Um, but that can cross-react much like if they were eating the whole wheat or something along those lines. And then, you, you, and that would be the parent that's taken all the wheat out, but, but Johnny's still crazy or still you know, aloof in class and that sort of stuff. It could be that you took all the wheat out, um, but then you, you substitute it with corn or something. And um, that's why I'm not, you don't hear me saying, you know, Dr. V says gluten-free diet, because gluten-free, most of those foods are going to be very high in corn. And so then we have corn issues with it. Um, so the, the, really the goal and the trick is to identify the main uh, offending food and as you, the parent, you know, if you're not seeing somebody that's running these tests, if you had to take, keep a log of what they're eating and how they behave, you know, it might be a good way to do it. But just pay attention. I mean, we, we've done some, some weed issues with Alora, my middle daughter. Um, my wife was the first one to notice that we were doing these gluten-free waffles for breakfast. And she noticed every time she did it, she was arguing with her sisters and, and you know, had these had challenges. Uh, so then we tested out and found that wheat was actually a, a big, big deal for her. Uh, and it was beautiful. I mean, um, we cut wheat out just a few months ago. Shamefully, it's me, you know, as her dad. And then we just cut uh, wheat out for her. And uh, she's a whole new kid on the soccer field. Her grades have gone way up, and, and she's learning faster and easier in school. So homework takes less time, uh, simply by cutting wheat out of her diet. Um, so, I mean, I had a, I mean, it's so profound. I had a gal that um, came to older, I mean, 24-ish, uh, came to me literally in a wheelchair, unable to walk. And I saw her a few times. We'd done some good work, got her feeling a little better. She went off on this um, journey to figure it out. Went to some special hospital in Arizona stayed there for two weeks while they did a bunch of tests and they said you have a mild neurojunction problem and, and you know that's it good you know go live <laughs> basically said your nerves are not telling your muscles to contract sorry you know uh, fortunately they didn't give her a bunch of meds or anything like that uh, she came back and I kind of was re just getting into some of this testing we realized that we were able to confirm that sesame was actually causing a gluten cross-reactive uh, reaction for her we cut got sesame out of her diet and she was able to walk again and get her driver's license back again and be a normal functioning girl and within a week and so about two three weeks later she went and had sushi they had a little sesame on the outside of the roll and she started feeling a little bit of weakness in the legs again so I mean it can be that profound uh, as we dig into these types of things so that's the the cross reactive food so if you're trying to figure this out with your child you, you might want to keep this around as you keep this list around as you try, start trying to figure out the the trigger foods for for um, your perfect child. This is a great one. This was just two weeks ago. Pearson is a kid that um, mom brings him from the Bay Area uh, for care every other month or so. Uh, this, is, this is her notes to me. This is what she wanted to work on. He was disrespectful, rude, full of hate, uh, full of anger. He's blaming his dad for everything who didn't. I mean, she was on her third or fourth husband. <laughs> um, blames her for everything. Very defiant. Um, you know, I'm thinking, well, we're going to have to talk about, you know, parenting issues potentially. Um, I treated him the first, the first day I saw him, I, there wasn't a whole lot of brain stuff going on. I found a little, an old brain injury in the temporal lobe of the brain. Did that. She said, ah, oh, he was a great kid. Uh, and then after, uh, and then mid-morning the next day, boom, he's in her face again. He, she says, you know, whatever, brush your teeth. No, I won't. And she's just complete, you know, obstinate and all over. And so, you know, clinician, I said, was it before or after breakfast? It was after breakfast. What did he eat? Uh, he had some bread. 
but he had yogurt. And so as I questioned it, he was, eating a two, he was eating at least two to three yogurts a day. And as I dug into it, using that list I just showed you, in his case, in Pearson's case, dairy was literally turning off the frontal lobe of the brain. And that's, that's I call it the axe murderer syndrome. <laughs> I mean, you get really unlogical. Uh, that's the short, that's uh, where we learn. It's logic, it's the emotional center. All that stuff goes out the window, in, in his case, just from, from dairy. Uh, so we got him off the dairy and he, he's been doing really well ever since and mom's, you know, not trying to send him to boarding school anymore. <laughs> uh, he's doing much better. So that's how profound the stuff can be. And I, I'm sharing just to kind of give you hope if you're some of the parents that are dealing with this type of stuff. <clears throat> so there's a, we're, we're in Southern California. We're in the Mecca of this kind of stuff. There's all sorts of good, healthy, viable options. Um, but things, you know, gluten-free foods, uh, this is from that Perlo Mutter Brain, Grain Brain book and, and website. Um, but extra virgin olive oil, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, almond milk is another good uh, dairy alternative. Uh, it's pretty blood type universal. Uh, rice milk will also typically work well. Um, soy milk sometimes. Uh, those are good uh, potential options. I just underlined some of the ones that we're talking about more typically. Try to hide your spinach and kale in the kids' shakes. Um, they're alkalizing. Um, the more alkaline the system is, the more stable blood sugar and less, less, more stable blood sugar will be and less prone to inflammation and infections they'll be as well. Um, tomatoes, unfortunately, are, um, I'll talk about that with the acetylcholine, but uh, they actually can cause anxiety, believe it or not. You know, unfortunately, I'm, throwing all these th previously healthy foods under the bus. <laughs> uh, tomatoes are relatively okay for O blood types. O blood types are about 44% of the population. Uh, but for the most of the rest of us, uh, tomatoes are usually a problem. Um, parsley ginger is a good um, digestive stimulant. So um, it works really well, especially you know, if you're eating your sushi and that sort of stuff or protein. Ginger will help. A lot of the digestive aid supplements have a lot of ginger in them. Um, Fruit, we talked about that in the blood sugar stabilizing aspect. Ketchup, again, it's tomato and, and often high fructose corn syrup in the ketchup. Uh, we're looking for challenges there. Uh.